Thank you very much. It is uh, very much my pleasure to be here with you again. Uh, I've had the opportunity to attend this Congress a number of times. It is an excellent Congress, and I'm very happy to be part of it. For my first presentation today, we will be talking about spontaneous breathing modes during mechanical ventilation. This is an area for which there has been a lot of interest in recent years. I will talk about some of the newer ventilator modes that are intended to be used with spontaneous ventilation. And then I'll talk more about the overall issue of whether or not we should allow our mechanically ventilated patients to breathe spontaneously. These are my disclosures. I don't believe that any of them have any impact on this presentation. Shown on this slide are conventional ventilator modes that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. We have continuous mandatory ventilation that most of us know as assist control. This is volume control ventilation, pressure control ventilation. There are modes that allow continuous spontaneous ventilation where there's no backup rate. This is pressure support ventilation that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And then we can mix mandatory and spontaneous breaths with synchronized IMV where we have either volume control or pressure control ventilation and if the patient's rate is greater than the rate set on the ventilator, the patient receives a pressure support breath. One of the points that I want to make is that there's a difference between a mandatory breath and a controlled breath. A mandatory breath relates to what the ventilator does. A controlled breath relates to what the patient does. And in fact, the only way that we get true controlled ventilation is if we apply neuromuscular blockade. And in fact, with any ventilator mode, the patient can breathe spontaneously in addition to what the ventilator applies with a mandatory breath. And I think it's also important to distinguish between a spontaneous breath and an assisted breath, remembering that the ventilator always assists the patient irregardless of what the mode is that we set on the ventilator. So I prefer to call, refer, I prefer to, re, prefer to use terms such as spontaneous breaths rather than assisted breaths because all breaths technically are assisted breaths. There are a number of ventilator modes that are intended to allow spontaneous breathing with some of these, there is no set rate, so it relies upon the patient's brainstem to trigger each breath. Those include things like pressure support ventilation, adaptive pressure support, which we'll talk about in detail in a minute, proportional assist ventilation, I will describe what that is, and neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, and we'll describe what that is. There are also modes that are intended to promote spontaneous breathing, but there is a backup race set on the ventilator. And those are things such as pressure control, adaptive pressure control, and airway pressure release ventilation. So let's spend a minute talking about adaptive pressure modes, adaptive pressure control, and adaptive pressure support. For these modes, the pressure applied by the ventilator is adjusted to maintain a target tidal volume. So we, the clinician, will dial into the ventilator the desired tidal volume, such as 400 milliliters. The ventilator will then adjust the level of pressure control or the level of pressure support up and down to maintain the target tidal volume. This goes by a variety of different names on different ventilators. Part of the confusion in mechanical ventilation is that different manufacturers use different names to describe the same thing. So here are a number of the modes that are adaptive pressure modes 
that allow pressure control or pressure support with a volume guarantee. So how this works is that if the tidal volume increases as is shown here, the ventilator will decrease the level of pressure, the level of pressure control or the level of pressure support to bring the tidal volume back to the target. Or if the tidal volume goes down as is shown here, the ventilator will increase the level of pressure in an attempt to maintain the tidal volume. This is a form of negative feedback control. I think a question that we might ask, is this good or are there unintended consequences? And I would submit to you that there may be some unintended consequences with adaptive pressure control or adaptive pressure support. This was very nicely described almost 15 years ago in the literature in which they did a study on patients in the ICU and they added dead space into the ventilator circuit to promote rebreathing to increase the respiratory drive and then they looked at the ventilator's response to that. And they looked at the ventilator response with conventional pressure support and with volume support ventilation, a form of adaptive pressure control. And what you can see is that when the dead space was added to the circuit with pressure support, the patient became more tachypneic, but the level of pressure did not change because that's how pressure support is intended to work. However, with volume support ventilation, when dead space was added to the circuit, increasing the respiratory drive, note that the, whoops, note that the ventilator takes away support. The amount of pressure applied from the ventilator decreases and the amount of pressure that is required from the diaphragm increases. In other words, as a result of the negative feedback control with adaptive pressure modes, if the, ventil if the patient demands more ventilation, the ventilator will take away the support, which I believe is one of the unintended consequences of these, this, these modes and something we should appreciate in practice is that the ventilator could decrease the level of support for the patient. Now, another spontaneous breathing mode is proportional assist ventilation. With proportional assist ventilation, there is positive feedback control. So in other words, if the patient demands more ventilation, the ventilator applies more pressure. Like many of these modes, they're only available on some ventilators. Proportional assist ventilation is only available in the Puritan Bennett ventilators for invasive ventilation and the respironics ventilator for non-invasive ventilation. Proportional assist ventilation is based upon the equation of motion. So it is physiologically sound, the equation of motion saying that the amount of pressure required to deliver the is equal to the volume divided by the compliance plus the flow times the resistance. With proportional assist ventilation, the ventilator monitors the inspiratory flow as a reflection of the patient's respiratory drive. The microprocessor in the ventilator integrates the flow to give volume. The ventilator periodically measures the resistance and compliance or estimates the resistance and compliance. So then if we know the resistance, we know the compliance, we know the flow, we know the volume, the ventilator can calculate the amount of pressure required to deliver the breath. And what we, the clinician, set at the ventilator is the proportion of that pressure that we will assist by the ventilator. So in other words, if we set the proportion of assist, of assist to 50%, the ventilator provides half of the pressure, the patient's respiratory muscles provide the other half of the pressure. It's important to appreciate that this mode is not a useful mode in patients who have motor neuron disease because with motor neuron disease, the patient's respiratory drive does not translate into flow because of the disease. 
With proportional assist ventilation, the ventilator also calculates the work of breathing. So the ventilator knows the flow, the ventilator knows the pressure, it can calculate the work of breathing. And what we set on the ventilator at the bedside is the level of assist from the ventilator in order to normalize the patient's work of breathing at about one half to one joule. So in other words, if the patient's work of breathing is increased, we would increase the level of assist. If the patient's work of breathing is very low, we would decrease the level of assist. Another spontaneous breathing mode, which for which there's not a backup rate, so this is a pure spontaneous breathing mode, is neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, or NAVA. Like proportional assist ventilation, this is only available on some ventilators specifically. This is only available on the servo uh, ventilators. This is again a form of positive feedback control. How this works is that there is a special nasogastric tube that is placed. There is an array of electrodes that monitors the electrical activity. In relation to the electrical activity of the diaphragm. So notice that when the electrical activity of the diaphragm increases, the pressure and the volume increase. When the electrical activity of the diaphragm is lower, the pressure applied to the ventilator is less, and the tidal volume delivery is also less. From a physiologic standpoint, I think it is physiologically sound. The issues are that it's only available on one manufacturer of ventilators, it requires a special nasogastric tube, and it actually requires a fair amount of clinical skill in order to have these electrodes aligned so that they correctly monitor the patient's diaphragmatic activity. Another mode which is intended to be a spontaneous breathing mode is APRV, airway pressure release ventilation. Airway pressure release ventilation, I believe I like to think of as the generic term. This is available at a number of different ventilators with a number of different names. So again, I think this is an area of confusion because depending upon the ventilator that you have available in your practice, airway pressure release ventilation will be called different things. With airway pressure release ventilation, there is a long period of high pressure where the patient can spontaneously breathe. So this represents spontaneous breathing efforts of the patient. Periodically, the pressure releases from the high pressure to the low pressure for a very short period of time. And then the pressure again increases to the high pressure level and the patient can spontaneously breathe at that high pressure. The high pressure, determines the oxygenation of the patient. Typically, that will be set at 25 centimeters of water or so. And the alveolar ventilation will be determined by the amount of spontaneous breathing and by the volume that is released when the pressure goes from the high pressure to the low pressure. Certainly, this is a mode that I think can improve oxygenation. It remains to be determined whether it improves mortality. And I think there are concerns about the transpulmonary pressure and the lung injury that might occur with the spontaneous breathing during the high pressure. This is sometimes called IMV, upside down IMV ventilation. If the patient's spontaneously breathing, it is inverse ratio ventilation if the patient is not spontaneously breathing. So a question we might ask ourselves is airway pressure release ventilation, APRV, lung protective and is it diaphragm protective? So as we'll get into in a few minutes, one of the themes of mechanical ventilation that is emerging is diaphragmatic protective ventilation 
as well as lung protective ventilation. So one of my concerns with APRV is over distension of high compliance alveoli with spontaneous breathing at the high pressure. Another concern is that there could be collapse and reopening of low compliance alveoli when the pressure goes from the high pressure setting to the low pressure setting. In this very recent study published just a few months ago, it showed that the release volume, the volume coming out of the lungs going from the high pressure to the low pressure is often more than 12 milliliters per kilogram of predicted body weight. So one might question whether this is really lung protective with those high volumes. And then there can also be with APRV, eccentric diaphragm contractions. And what this means is that the patient may be making inspiratory efforts during expiratory flow. So the patient may be making inspiratory efforts when the pressure releases from the high pressure to the low pressure. Or in other words, this is diaphragm activation while the muscle is lengthening. And that is a potential form of skeletal muscle injury, in this case, uh, diaphragm injury. More about that in a few minutes. So then the question might be, is spontaneous breathing good during mechanically ventilated patients in the ICU? So in the ICU, in our patients, intubated on the ventilator, is spontaneous breathing good? And as I've outlined on this slide, there, is, there are good, and there are bad aspects of spontaneous uh, ventilation. So the good part is that it requires decreased sedation. I think that's good. There's less delirium. That's certainly good. Maybe better gas exchange. No one would argue that that's good. Improved hemodynamics because the spontaneous breathing may improve venous return. And it may maintain respiratory muscle activity in that way preventing atrophy. But on the other hand, with spontaneous breathing, there can be higher tidal volumes and higher transpulmonary pressures. I will expand on that in the next slide. That could be potentially injurious. There could be double triggering of the ventilator and breast stacking. That might be injurious. There could be respiratory muscle harm with high activity of the diaphragm and other respiratory muscles. And then there could be pendula, where there is gas which moves from one part of the lung to another part of the lung, contributing to over distension. So let's talk a little bit more detail about some of these potentially injurious aspects of spontaneous breathing, so that in an individual patient, we can balance the good versus the harm. So imagine that we have a patient on pressure control or pressure support ventilation, and we set the pressure on the ventilator to 15 centimeters of water and a PEEP of five. By definition, the ventilator will apply a pressure of 20 centimeters of water to the proximal airway throughout the inspiratory phase. So that's pressure control, pressure support. By definition, that's how the mode works. But let's imagine that when the ventilator is applying a pressure of 20 centimeters of water to the airway, the patient is making a strong inspiratory effort, decreasing the pleural pressure to minus 18 centimeters of water. So this is your patient on pressure control or pressure support, where the patient is making a strong inspiratory effort. Notice here that the descending pressure across the lung, the alveolar stretch, is 35 centimeters of water. I would argue that that is potentially injurious to the lungs. And in fact, this was shown very nicely in a paper published in the Blue Journal a couple of years ago, where these authors, well-known authors, uh, wrote that it is important to ascertain whether the spontaneously breathing patient in fact has a high respiratory drive and has adopted a ventilatory pattern which could lead to subsequent lung injury. And what they're talking about here
And they go on to say this is not a trivial matter. And in fact, these authors define the term, they coined the term, patient self-inflicted lung injury, which is more likely with pressure control ventilation or pressure support ventilation because the amount of effort generated by the patient adds to the pressure applied to the airway. So this is something then that I think is important to appreciate. When we use modes like pressure support ventilation and other spontaneous breathing modes, and the patient is making vigorous and supporting efforts. Can this actually occur in real life? Well, this is a patient I helped to take care of a few years ago. We placed an esophageal balloon catheter. You can see this patient is making very vigorous inspiratory efforts. And when those efforts are added to the pressure applied to the airway, indeed, there is a very large transpulmonary pressure, a transpulmonary pressure that I believe most would consider injurious. This was also illustrated in this paper that I showed previously. So here, when dead space was added to the circuit, you can see the large swings in esophageal pressure, which is potentially injurious, I would submit. It's also important to appreciate that when a patient makes a vigorous inspiratory effort during mechanical ventilation, that the regional inspiratory pressure may be less, so the regional, I should say, should may be more, the regional inspiratory pressure may be greater than what we might measure with a technique such as esophageal manometry. And as it turns out, the greater pleural pressure swings tend to be in the more dependent part of the lungs so that there could be regional alveolar over distension if a patient is making vigorous inspiratory efforts during spontaneous breathing modes. And then what has been reported just recently within the last five years is not only are there these regional pleural pressure swings, but there can also be penduluft in which gas is pulled from one part of a lung of the lung to another part of the lungs. So as a result of regional differences in pleural pressure change with spontaneous breathing efforts, and as a result of penduluft, where gas is pulled from one part of the lung to another, there might actually be regional over distension in the dependent parts of the lungs. Another issue that we need to pay attention to with spontaneous breathing modes is the potential for double triggering. So some, but not all, uh, probably a minority of patients, but at least some patients on spontaneous breathing modes will double trigger. And the issue with double triggering is that it increases the tidal volume that is delivered. So we may have the ventilator set for a tidal volume of six milliliters per kilogram of predicted body weight, but if the patient double triggers two breaths in rapid succession, the tidal volume might actually be 12 mLs per kilogram of ideal body weight. And this was shown nicely, I think, in this study published a few years ago, showing that here the set tidal volume on average is about six mLs per kilogram, but when patients double trigger, the tidal volume can reach nearly twice that. So it's important then to assess our patients who are breathing spontaneously to determine whether they're making vigorous inspiratory efforts and increasing the tidal volume in that way, but also whether they may be double triggering the ventilator and increasing the tidal volume in that way. So then is spontaneous breathing good or not good in our mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS, for example? This was explored in an animal study published about five years ago. And what these authors reported was that in a small animal model, I believe these were rabbits, with mild, in, with mild lung injury, 
If the patients were allowed to, uh, patients, if the animals were allowed to breathe spontaneously, as you can see on the histology, that was good for the lung. So with mild, in, with mild lung injury uh, to the animals, uh, no spontaneous breathing, injury, spontaneous breathing, less injury. However, in other animals, which had severe lung injury, if there was spontaneous breathing, there was greater injury, as you can see from the histology, than there was with no spontaneous breathing. So this is an animal model, but it suggests that maybe spontaneous breathing is good with mild injury, but it is harmful with more severe injury to the lung. The other thing we need to think about with spontaneous breathing and spontaneous breathing modes is the effect that that has on the diaphragm and other respiratory muscles. And this is something that has become increasingly appreciated just in recent years. The potential for diaphragmatic injury during mechanical ventilation. And what one can see is if there is over assistance, in other words, there is too much support that is applied uh, by the ventilator, that can result in disuse atrophy. On the other hand, if there's too little support that is applied by the ventilator, that can result in excess muscle loading and that can result in diaphragm injury. And then we can also get diaphragm injury due to eccentric contractions of the diaphragm that I mentioned previously in respect to APRV, where the diaphragm is contracting when there is gas that is flowing out of the lungs. So increasingly then, we should be thinking about not only lung protective ventilation, but also diaphragmatic or diaphragm protective mechanical ventilation, because if we provide too much support, that results in atrophy. But at the other extreme, if we provide too little support, that results in injury. So it's important, and in either case, atrophy or injury, there can be respiratory muscle weakness and difficulty with liberation of the patient from the ventilator. So then it's important that we get it just right. So the challenge to we as clinicians at the ventilator is to provide the right level of support so we don't provide too little support, which results in injury, or too much support, which also results in injury. Now, what evidence do we have regarding the role of spontaneous breathing modes and patient outcomes? Turns out that there's very little. There is a lot of physiology, not a lot of outcome studies. The only one that I'm really aware of is this observational study, which was a secondary analysis of the lung safe study, where they reported that spontaneous breathing was not, was not associated with worse outcomes and may hasten liberation from the ventilator and from the ICU. So we should, I believe, be considering the use of spontaneous breathing modes in many of our mechanically ventilated patients, but also being aware of the types of injuries that can occur, as I've described in this presentation. So in summary then, when studying the ventilator, we as clinicians have a number of things that we need to consider at the bedside. Certainly we need to consider gas exchange. So traditionally when we set the ventilator, we set the ventilator according to the blood gas. But we also need to consider hemodynamics, certainly. We need to consider patient ventilator synchrony, patient comfort, ventilator-induced lung injury. And now, I believe we also need to consider the potential for diaphragm injury with spontaneous breathing modes. And at the bedside, we need to balance all of these things for the best outcomes of our patients.
So with that, I will stop. I will thank you for your attention. I don't know if we have time for questions. According to the timer, I have. So thank you very much.